Good morning and welcome to today's webinar. Today we're going to show you how to get started marketing an immigration law practice online. Today's webinar is being recorded and it will be made available online for replay either tomorrow or early next week along with the slides and notes. Therefore, there's no reason to take notes while you're going along. We have a lot of ground to cover today, including three specialists who are going to talk about different aspects of getting started the right way. This is the first in a three-part webinar series, and we've done several others in this series uh, covering starting other practice areas and practice types throughout this month. This webinar is scheduled to run about two hours today. And we have noticed that previous webinars have tended to run a little bit longer, uh, typically about two hours and 15 minutes. We are not going to be able to stop to answer questions during the presentation. But if you are having technical difficulties with the audio or video of the GoToWebinar control panel, please let us know in the chat area or in the questions area. We will have time at the end for those of you who want to stick around to answer questions uh, once we're done with this two hour plus presentation. And so if you do have questions that occur along the way, please feel free to put them in the GoToWebinar control panel questions area and we'll address them all at the end. My name is Dan Jaffe. Before becoming the full-time CEO of Lawlytics, I built two successful law firms, first in Washington State and then in Arizona, and started a highly successful online directory that was ultimately acquired by a large internet company. During my years of law practice, I made a lot of marketing investments and got badly burned several times. I realized that nobody cared about my practice like I did and that in order to succeed, I needed to understand how the internet really worked and I needed to be in control of my own law firm's marketing. So I did the heavy lifting back then to figure out how this stuff really works. And today I love showing my fellow attorneys how to start getting ahead and how this stuff uh, really works. We have a great program for you today. Each of our presenters is a specialist in her own area. I'm going to introduce each of them to you now so that we can move rapidly from one presenter to the next without delay once we get started. Victoria Blute comes from a journalism background and is the community manager here at Lawlytics. If you're a frequent reader of our blog or if you've watched other webinars that we've done recently, you're undoubtedly familiar with her work already. Victoria is going to talk about how your potential clients use the internet and how you can attract them and capture their business by understanding the basics of how the internet works. Rachel Shalott holds a JD and a master's degree and practiced law before joining Lawlytics. She's the vice president of content operations here at Lawlytics, which means that she's in charge of all of the content that we produce for our members, attorneys, websites, and blogs, which amounts to millions of written words every year. Rachel will discuss content strategies specific to starting an immigration law web presence. Sophia Oliboni holds a master's degree in web design and is a design specialist here at Lawlytics. When new members sign up for our service, she and her team help them choose their design preferences based on their goals. Today, Sophia is going to walk you through some of the things that all attorneys should know about website design. The marketing of immigration law has changed in recent years and is continuing to evolve very quickly. In fact, Given recent events, given what's going on, I can't imagine that there's ever been a more uh, volatile and more exciting time for immigration lawyers to be talking about various issues and uh, there's probably a lot of room to attract interest to your practice, your firm, and yourself that there hasn't been over, over the last uh, couple decades since the internet really came online. For attorneys who are willing to evolve with the internet, there is an opportunity to make a lot of money. The internet presents a way to get ahead of established and market leading law firms that simply aren't adapting. The internet has become the great equalizer. No longer is marketing success for immigration matters uh, and for immigration lawyers simply a matter of budget, 
and willingness to take financial risks. Now any attorney can break into uh, the business of seriously attracting uh, immigration matters and the revenue that comes along with that with a minimum of financial investment. And the previously established attorneys who are not adapting are not safe no matter how big their budgets were for other types of marketing or how solidified or large their reputation is. This webinar will show you how to lay the foundation to compete now and for the foreseeable future. The things that we will discuss require you to expend some effort or they require you to budget to pay somebody for their efforts. Done right, the outcome of either path is the same. Whichever path you choose, when you make the commitment to building the foundation of your immigration practice online marketing the right way, and you understand the strategy that goes into it, the time and money you spend will not be wasted. What's great about the evolution of marketing for immigration cases and matters is that any attorney anywhere can get started easily and cost effectively. And that's what this webinar is really all about. And when you know how to avoid the traps and the tricks that too many lawyers fall into while they're asleep at the switch and learn how to do a few simple things, there's a ton of money to be made. Today's webinar is the first in a series of three that will take you from really just getting started with an immigration practice or at least getting started marketing it online to market domination. Today we're going to cover the very basics. We hope today's webinar will provide you with a solid understanding and the motivation to get started in the right direction or if your marketing has been there before and it's simply not working anymore to get restarted on your way to success. The next webinar in this series, which we'll be doing next month, uh, will focus on growing an immigration practice using the internet. For that webinar, we'll assume that you understand the fundamentals and that you've applied them to your law firm's website and blog, or at least have started the process of applying them. That webinar will show you how the real money is made for most law firms. We'll take a much deeper dive into the forces that drive online success, including content, reputation management, and other things including SEO. And we'll give you a more detailed content roadmap to develop your immigration law marketing. The final webinar in this series, which happens in March, will focus on crossing the chasm between growing a thriving practice and a truly dominant one using the internet. We have customers who are truly dominating their markets, and I can tell you that each of them started with the fundamentals that we're going to be going over in today's webinar. The final webinar, which happens in March, will show you that extra 2 to 3 percent that you can then push the needle forward, uh, that 2 to 3 percent difference maker that really becomes effective at scale, but when you're in the start or grow phase are mission killers because they're just not effective until you get to scale. If you're looking to take your immigration law marketing to the pinnacle of success, we do recommend that you attend or watch on demand all three webinars and implement the recommendations that we're going to be talking about in chronological order. This webinar is for lawyers and staff members of law firms that are either currently handling immigration cases or matters or that plan to in the future. You don't need to be a Lawlytics member to benefit from this webinar, but Everything that we will be talking about will be much easier for you to implement if you are a member because the Lawlytics system and service is built and optimized for that purpose. If you're just getting started with your website, this webinar is a great place to begin. And if your website isn't working, it's likely because one or more of the fundamentals that we'll cover today has been ignored or has been poorly implemented. If you're here listening to this today, it's probably because you want your website to bring in more immigration matters, more viable clients, and more referrals. But being here isn't enough. There are no participation trophies in the practice of law. Either you get the client's business or you don't. If you want to succeed, you will need to commit to investing either your time or your money, and sometimes both. 
That's because there are no shortcuts or magic tricks that will make you successful. But there is a roadmap. The goal of this session is simple. We want you to understand how to build your firm's online marketing for immigration cases using sound and uh, sustainable strategies and to be able to use that foundation to effectively take your marketing really as far as you want it to go. We hope that what you learn today will help you capture more opportunities so that your success will in turn open the door to even greater levels of marketing resources and achievements and therefore stability. By the time this webinar is over, we hope you'll have a foundation to do the following. First, start smart. You only need to do a few things well from the start as long as you take caution and avoid the traps. Two, don't overcomplicate. Building a thriving law firm web presence is easier than most attorneys think or have been led to believe. And finally, three, your participation does matter. That's because nobody cares about your practice as much as you do. You need to be involved and you need to be in control. This does not mean that you have to do everything or even anything by yourself. But you need to know what needs to be done and why it needs to be done so you can recognize value and avoid wasting time and money. The good news is that participating is easy and participating can actually be fun. And this webinar will show you how. You have many choices of companies and technologies to design, build, host, and help you market your law firm's website. At Lawlytics, we do all that, and we have a lot of competition. I see that there are several people in attendance who are not yet Lawlytics members, so we're going to take a few moments to talk about what Lawlytics is and what we do. So what is Lawlytics, and, and how are we different? To start with, our company is obsessed with the pursuit of the most efficient methods of marketing for each law firm. There are two major variables of efficiency, time and money. Lawlytics was created to empower law firms to have unlimited marketing success without wasting time or money. We have two different types of competitors. On one side are full service marketing companies, companies such as Fine Law and Martindell. Lawlytics is built to give attorneys all of the upside of using a full service company without exposing them to the potential downsides and the potential risks. On the other side of the spectrum are do-it-yourself website programs like WordPress and Wix and many others. And these programs tend to be very cheap or even free to use. These programs also happen to come with very steep opportunity costs and attorneys often struggle to make them work and in the process of that struggle, end up wasting their time and missing valuable opportunities and potential clients along the way. While both full service companies and do-it-yourself platforms are viable options, Lawlytics offers what we see as a more practical solution for lawyers. Our company works exclusively with lawyers and our services are adaptable to every stage of a law firm's growth. So when you're a, law firm, a Lawlytics law firm member, you can start as small as you choose and you can grow as big as you decide without taking dangerous risks or over committing to things that just might not work. And our software was built exclusively for lawyers. So the learning curve is easy, which enables our members to add to and edit their websites and turn their efforts into new business without struggling. Lawlytics is a member-based law firm website marketing service. Our software and service is specifically built for and optimized for law firms. For those of you who are not yet Lawlytics members, here's how the process works in a nutshell. The first step is to have a conversation with us to make sure that there's an alignment between the needs and goals of your firm and our services. Once you've decided that that alignment is there and that Lawlytics is for you, the next step is to start uh, your law firm's membership with Lawlytics. We'll guide you through that process, which is streamlined to take about five minutes online. Then we start the process of setting up and styling your law firm's website. 
This is a collaborative process, and you'll work with one of our full-time professional designers one-on-one -on -one to achieve the optimal look and feel to meet your goals. The next step is adding content to your website. The goal of this phase is to have enough content to be able to successfully launch your site. If you already have a website that you want to import into the Lawlytics system, we have the process of transitioning from other platforms to Lawlytics down to a science. If you're starting a new website with Lawlytics, we'll guide you through the, the content that you need to launch. In a little while, Rachel will talk about uh, what content is needed to launch an immigration law website and how to build a strong foundation with that content now to prepare for future growth. You can choose to create your own content or you can always have our team of professional writers do it for you. Regardless of which path you choose, when your site is ready, we'll launch it for you. If you're switching from another provider, we'll make sure that there's no downtime or loss of traffic in the process. When you're switching to Lawlytics, um, whether you're, you're switching from somewhere else or whether you're starting fresh with a, a new website, we'll take care of all of the technical details for you. Once your site is launched, we'll show you how to use the Lawlytics system to add to and edit your website, regardless of your previous tech experience. We can take you from zero to very highly competent very quickly because our system was built for busy lawyers who simply don't have the time to mess around with complicated technology. Once there, you'll be able to instantly add and edit office locations, attorney bios, case results, recommendations, substantive pages, and blog posts. You'll be able to easily rearrange your site's menu by dragging and dropping. You'll be able to create simple and detailed web forms to capture information from clients and potential clients. You'll be able to easily insert pictures, videos, documents, and maps into pages of your site. In short, you'll have the power to be as involved in your own website as you choose to be. And beyond the mechanics, we'll teach you how to implement a strategy that best suits the market, your practice area or areas, and the ambitions of your law firm. We'll show you what works and how to create it without wasting time or money. And even though you'll be able to do it yourself, if you ever choose not to, you can delegate some or all of your efforts to us. You likely already understand the importance of having a website for your immigration law practice. But I want to take a moment to look at the most important reasons why it's essential to not just have a website, but to invest in the kind of website that we'll be showing you how to build during this three-part series. Keeping these reasons in mind will be just as important in the growth and domination phases of your firm's marketing as they are in this start phase. Your potential immigration clients are online, and they're using the internet to do research and to make decisions. Even when immigration clients are referred directly to you, they will still interact with your web presence before making the decision to hire you. If you don't have a website, you're simply at the mercy of everything else about you that exists on the internet, and you have little or no control over it. With a website, on the other hand, you have complete control over your messaging, and you have an opportunity to win the hearts and minds of your potential clients. Your website is there to educate your potential clients about their case, about uh, their rights, about their options, and about the different paths that they may follow to achieve their immigration goals. It's there to make a personal connection between you and your potential clients and to cause potential clients to like you and then to want to hire you. The most important functions of your law firm's website are to, one, show that you care, two, show that you know, and three, show that you're successful. Let's look at these things in turn. These things set the tone for the attorney-client relationship because they establish trust, they establish authority, and they establish confidence. And when you have your potential clients' trust and confidence, and when they see you as an authority before the attorney-client relationship even begins, your chances of them hiring you drastically increase. And the benefits go well beyond marketing and sales. 
Establishing trust, authority, and confidence helps frame the attorney-client relationship and helps set expectations. This ultimately makes the experience easier and more rewarding for both you and for your clients. As we present this webinar today, it's January 2017. If you're just getting started with your law firm's website, you're already very late to the game. But that's okay because for better or worse, most attorneys who've been in this game even for many years have been, been playing it poorly because they've been listening to the wrong people and they've been doing the wrong things. Website marketing for immigration matters and immigration cases works. And it can work better than any other source of business for your firm when it's done well. So while everyone is doing it, the fact that most attorneys don't have websites that are performing to their full potential is an opportunity for you and your immigration practice. Having a website is a matter of basic business survival. But having a website that you consciously cultivate using the Lawlytics system and the information that you'll get in this webinar series and from other Lawlytics webinars that you can find on demand and that we'll do in the future, you can elevate your practice by multiples. We've seen attorneys who were struggling to stay in business start using the Lawlytics system and become secure and stable in their practices. And we've seen attorneys who really thought they were doing quite well in their practices start using the Lawlytics system and literally double their business while actually decreasing their marketing overhead. There's no magic trick here. There's a proven method and there's a window of opportunity. Creating a worthwhile website for your law firm is like investing with compounding interest. The earlier you get started, the better off you'll be in the long run. And like sound investing, there need not be anything fancy here. You don't need tricks, you don't need cheats, you don't need hacks, you don't need all that SEO voodoo that a lot of vendors sell. All you need is an understanding of the fundamentals and the technology and time to leverage those fundamentals effectively over time. At Lawlytics, we use the phrase marketing assets regularly. Before I turn the floor over to Tori, I want to take a moment and explain what we mean by that and why it's important. Most marketing that you do for your law firm falls into the category of an expense. The nature of most advertising is that you buy it, it gets used up, and then it's gone forever. Let's look at some examples of marketing that falls into the expense category. You've got yellow page advertising. You buy it, the book's out for a year, people throw it away, and then it's useless. Billboard advertising, you pay for it, and then when the time's up, they take it down, and it's gone forever. Same with TV, same with radio. These are clear-cut examples, but online it's not always so obvious. When you, for example, rent a directory listing or a sponsored listing on a website or a premium spot, you're renting disposable advertising, and this is an expense. If you don't renew and continue to pay for it, it goes away. Pay-per-click advertising is also an expense. You make a bid for a customer of a search engine to click on your ad, and when they do that, the money is gone. And it doesn't matter whether that person is a marketer looking to cold call you and sell you stuff, whether it's one of your competitors, whether it's a, a student doing research, or whether it's actually a viable potential client with a matter that you can help. Whatever the case is, they click, your money is gone forever. Same thing with banner ads, remarketing ads, online magazine ads, social media ads, etc. But content, on the other hand, placed on a website that you own and control is a marketing asset because once the content is produced, it can continue to produce business for you indefinitely. Think of it like owning a building in a prime location with great signage. Once that building is paid for and the sign is also paid off, each additional impression that that sign in that building makes on the public passing by costs you nothing. Well, nothing aside from the cost of maintaining the building, obviously, taxes and so forth. With content, you invest your efforts or dollars once, and if done well, your potential clients will interact with it for years to come through the search engines and through many other sources. With Lawlytics, you own your website and all of your content, and we're here to help you strategically maintain and grow that infrastructure. 
It's important to note that just because you create content online doesn't always mean that you own it. For example, if you're writing answers for a legal directory or forum that you don't own, you're investing in creating assets for a company that actually owns the directory or forum. And usually those companies are in business to make money, if not now, then eventually. And therefore, to benefit from those assets, you'll likely have to pay, if not now, then sometime in the future. And when they're looking to make money from it, if you don't pay, then they will find somebody else, usually one of your competitors who will, and the efforts that you put into it along with your name, if it's attached to those efforts, will then serve to attract business to your competitor who is willing to pay to, to, to play. This is a topic in and of itself that could fill more than a two-hour webinar. And if you want to go deeper into it, Google commoditization of lawyers and uh, read the piece that I wrote on the subject a few years back. Uh, it's, it's even more relevant today than it was back then because a lot of the things are, 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 are happening much more rapidly now and further eroding the control that attorneys have. But the, the good news is that it is uh, preventable once you understand the business model uh, and, and can essentially defend yourself against it. Because here at Lawlytics we're obsessed with helping lawyers find the most efficient ways to market their law firms online, and because we're sticklers about not letting attorneys waste their time or their money, it bears repeating that everything that Lawlytics does and helps you do is geared towards appreciating or creating appreciating marketing assets that you own and that you can control. In a few moments, Tori, Rachel, and Sophia will talk to you about various aspects of the appreciating asset that is your law firm's website. Before I turn the floor over to Victoria, I want to spend uh, just a few more moments talking about uh, content. So what is content and why should lawyers be doing it? Most lawyers think they need a thing called SEO which stands for Search Engine Optimization. It's about making it easy for potential clients to find your law firm through free search engine results. Content marketing is the most important ingredient of SEO. You may have heard the term or the phrase content is king, and that has been true for many years. It's true now, and it will continue to be true as long as the search engines uh, continue to stay in business with their, their, their core business models. So content is the most important ingredient of SEO, and without enough high-quality content, no other aspect of SEO will ever be effective. In fact, most other aspects of SEO that are sold to lawyers are simply party tricks, illusions, and things that don't work. So when you sit across the desk from a potential immigration client, whether it's a crimmigration case, whether it's, it's uh, somebody that is trying to get citizenship, whether it's a, a business uh, relocation, whatever the case may be, you and your client are engaged in a conversation. You're engaged in a discovery process. You're evaluating the potential client's matter, and your potential client is evaluating your ability to help him or her with that matter. But you're also engaged in marketing and sales. Everything that you say about your firm and yourself and their case, in general, guides their perception of you and of your firm. Everything they see in your office, from the decor on the walls, to the books on the shelf, to the way that your receptionist treats them, to the conference room, uh, everything in your office helps them create a story in their mind of who you are and whether they want to do business with you. Content marketing is about preloading your potential client's perceptions about you and your firm. The information that would normally uh, be provided to them at the first meeting, whatever that is, if that can be put on your website without giving away all of the benefit of hiring you, the more of that you can do, the better. And here's why. Your potential immigration clients are searching for answers as much as they're searching for an attorney. When you provide them with complete and helpful answers as opposed to the keyword-based nonsense and uh, self-serving marketing copy that ends up getting put on most law firm websites, something very efficient happens. First, the search engines give it preference because it's good content. Then your clients or potential clients find it, and what they find is directly responsive to the questions that they ask the search engines. 
because of this, they instantly know that you care. They know that you know. And because you provided them information that's directly responsive to their needs, and because it's technical in nature, they suspect that therefore you're successful. And they can get further verification of that by looking at other aspects of your website, which Tori will get into a little bit more, such as uh, your recommendations and your case results. Four, they trust you before the, you even speak with them because in a way, by putting information on your website, you've already helped them with their matter. And because of this, they become much more likely to hire you. And when they do hire you, they're much easier to manage because their expectations and their knowledge are aligned with, with your practice and, uh, and the way that the system and the law works. In the next two segments of this webinar, Victoria and Rachel are going to go into detail um, about the basics of getting started on the right track with high quality content for your immigration practice. And with that, I'd like to turn the microphone over to Victoria, who's going to talk about the basics of search engines and how to get started building your immigration web presence the right way. Tori? Hey, Dan. Thank you so much. Um, can you hear me? I can. Great. Um, good morning and good afternoon to those of you who are on the East Coast. For those of you who aren't familiar with me, my name is Victoria Blute and I'm the community manager here at Lawlytics. My job is to keep attorneys on the cutting edge of web technologies and online legal marketing and to help you learn what works on the web. So now that Dan has discussed a little bit about the foundational aspects of marketing your immigration law firm, I'm going to explain to you how your potential clients use the internet. We're also going to talk about how they don't use the internet because um, that's just as important. We're going to talk about how to recognize some of the myths that go along with online legal marketing and what you need to attract potential clients to your firm. And a lot of that starts with understanding some terminology and how the internet works. So the first slide that I want to discuss is going to set the tone for a lot of what I'm going to be talking about. And it's important whether or not you're familiar with this term. If you are, you may want to um, sort of examine your assumptions about what you think this term means. Dan brought it up before, and that is SEO, um, which of course stands for Search Engine Optimization. And I've heard it described a number of ways, some descriptions which are fairly accurate, others which are are completely off the mark, um, but I think the best way to describe SEO is to say that it's the process of growing your website's visibility in organic search engine results. So in other words, helping more potential clients find you on search engines. For those of you who are familiar with this term and with this idea, this may seem like a rather obvious sort of description. Um, and I may end up discussing some topics that seem quite basic, but it's important to bring it up because attorneys sometimes get caught in this trap of understanding what SEO is as it's defined here, but making some mistakes in how that process is carried out. So if you have some preconceived notions, about how this works, um, check to see if those are in line with what I'm saying. And if this is all new to you and you're starting with a blank slate, that's great also. So let us first talk about how search engines work and then we're going to talk about how your potential clients are using search engines to find you. So search engines work by finding, gathering, and displaying relevant information to the people who are searching for it. When Google began as a company, their founders said that they wanted to organize all of the world's information, and that's sort of how we got here. There are three basic steps here that the search engines go through, and if you hear me say Google a lot instead of just search engines in general, um, know that the process is similar for all search engines. I say Google because that is the most popular search engine. Um, they hold the dominant market share. People do certainly use Bing and Yahoo search, but there is a reason why Google is also a verb, as in to Google, and that's because it's the best and most popular method for finding information that people need. Okay, so step one is crawling. You will hear other terms for crawling or crawlers. You will hear them described as Google's spiders or bots. Um, whatever you want to call it, Google has these robots that are busy crawling the web. And what I mean when I say crawling is that these robots follow links from page to page and see what's there. 
Google then sorts those pages by the content that is featured on them and some other factors. Once Google finds a web page and figures out what's on there, Google then adds that page to its massive 100 million gigabyte index. And Google does that so that it can quickly access that information again when a search engine user makes a relevant query. The last step in this process is retrieval. And that is what all of the crawling and the indexing is for in the first place. At this point, Google gets a query, quickly decides what's most relevant, and then it pulls that information um, from its index and delivers those pages as search results. For example, if somebody searches for something like, can you become a US citizen if you get a DUI while you're visiting the United States? Google will search through its index looking for the most relevant answer to that question. Now, how Google makes a decision about what kinds of results are the most relevant is to some degree shrouded in mystery. There are hundreds and hundreds of different factors in that decision and they all hold different weight and Google doesn't tell us about what those are exactly. But as the company has famously said, they want you to make websites for people, not for search engines. So if you're going to make a website for a person and not for a search engine, just how do you do how do you accomplish that exactly? And what that requires is an understanding of how people, or in this case, your potential clients, actually use search engines. This is an area where there can be a bit of a disconnect for attorneys, but when you understand how this works and you're able to put it into action, this is where your marketing can really take off. So let's talk about how your potential clients use search engines to find you. We are going to start with a hypothetical scenario. So for a moment, I want you to imagine that you are your immigration firm's potential client. In your mind, map the route that a potential client takes from needing an immigration attorney to finding your firm's website and contacting you. What does that process look like? Now, what I'll show you next is what we hear from a lot of attorneys, and we'll use an immigration attorney um, as an example here. Does your answer look something like this? My potential client opens their laptop, they go to Google, then because they need an immigration attorney in Arizona, they conduct a search for immigration attorney in Arizona. They find my website because I'm an immigration attorney in Arizona, and then they contact my law firm. Does your answer look something like this one? If it does, this is a common misunderstanding some attorneys have when they think about how potential clients search for them online. They tend to assume that the path to successful online legal marketing works in this way, but when they think that it works in this way, they also end up frustrated and spending a lot of money and time on things that they don't need and that don't work. So to do your marketing efficiently and to do it cost effectively online, there is a, one major component that you need, Dan talked about it earlier, and that is this, content. So the very shortest answer to explain what SEO is really about and how to attract potential clients online is that your website needs content. And we're going to talk about content in depth, but to really understand why content is the answer, we have to understand why that hypothetical scenario that we just talked about doesn't make any sense. So in that example, we have three possible assumptions. The first is that potential clients usually know that they need an attorney before they conduct a search. The second is that potential clients usually search for attorneys directly. And the third is that potential clients usually conduct basic keyword searches to find an immigration attorney. There's a fourth assumption in there, and that's that your potential client is using a laptop rather than a mobile device. Um, Mobile-friendly sites are something that we'll discuss a little bit later. But let's look at each of those assumptions and why that's not how your potential clients use search engines, um, and also how content is the right online marketing solution here. So, and the first assumption is that potential clients usually know that they need an attorney before they conduct a search, and this is not always the case. Um, what potential clients often know is that they've got a problem that they're not sure how to solve or a question that they need an answer to. So they open their laptops and they go to Google, and then they conduct question-based searches. So instead of searching for something like immigration lawyer or Arizona deportation defense, a potential client may ask a complex question instead. Something like, what are the requirements for bringing a non-citizen to the United States to work as an engineer? 
some potential clients may suspect that they need an immigration attorney. They may still do research about how their current problem could affect them, however. And the thing that links their questions and the results to Google returns and your immigration firm is content. Keep in mind that when somebody asks Google a question, Google's main focus is to return the most relevant results for the person who made that search. And this is what Google is talking about when it says that you should make websites for people and not for search engines. People need answers and Google's goal is to provide the best ones. And they want the best content that they can offer their users. It's the entire basis of, of their business model. Google is the dominant search engine because they provide the best answers of any search engine and if your website is providing insightful content that answers the questions that your potential clients are asking, that's how you increase not only your visibility but your ability to actually connect with those potential clients and to build your practice. The second assumption is that potential clients usually search for attorneys directly and again, this is not true. Potential clients do not always um, or even usually search for attorneys directly and this is a flawed assumption because it assumes that potential clients um, search for an attorney in the same way that somebody might search for a t-shirt brand at a local store. So somebody might search for Hanes t-shirts Target San Diego and the intent there is to see if a local Target has that shirt brand in stock. But we have to keep in mind that a t-shirt is a consumer product. That person likely knows roughly what they want and where they want to buy it. They are just checking to see. It's an easy decision. Choosing an immigration attorney is an important process and a complex process and it's one that has real effects for the potential client. And despite the attempted commoditization of attorneys by the legal marketing industry, attorneys are not consumer products products and potential clients don't search for attorneys in the same way that they might for a shirt. The third assumption is that potential clients usually conduct basic keyword searches to find an attorney. In that example, the basic keyword search was immigration attorney Arizona. Consider the basic keyword search for Hanes t-shirts target. Now this example assumes that a person is going to conduct a vague search. Maybe this person just wants to see if Target carries Hanes shirts. But if that person already knows what they want, what they're more likely to do is to conduct a highly specific search. So think about the different results you'd get by searching for Hanes t-shirts Target versus something like Hanes men's v-neck white t-shirt size XL Target San Diego. That first search is going to bring you a lot of different results about a lot of different shirts. The second search is going to quickly tell you whether that store has exactly what you need. And my point in saying this is that people don't want to sift through results. They want an immediate answer in the digital age and they've really come to expect it at this point. And the same goes for your potential clients when they ask questions of Google. They are not likely to search for something vague like immigration attorney and then scan through hundreds of results. They've got a question about their problem and they want an answer to that problem. So when potential clients ask specific questions, Google is going to attempt to provide specific results. And when you answer those questions with quality content on your law firm's website and blog, you're more likely to be found in search results because your content closely matches a potential client's question. And by giving them the information that they need, you're more likely to create a bond of trust that encourages them to contact your firm. So here's an example of how law firm SEO actually does work for attorneys. Let's say we have a potential client who conducts a Google search like this. Um, if I'm on a work visa in the United States and I lose my job, how can I stay in the US? Maybe you've written a blog post about this topic with lots of useful information. You write the blog post in language that the potential client uses. It makes it easy for them to understand. The potential client reads what you have to say and it's helped to answer their question. And maybe now that they're visiting your law firm's website or blog, they look around and they read other content that you've written. And when what you've written is helpful and informative, your potential client begins to build that bond of trust with you. Your content demonstrates that you understand their problem and that you know what the potential client should do. At this point, they reach out to you when they want more information or when they're ready to hire you. This is an example of how your potential clients actually use search engines and how they are likely to connect with you online. 
Now there's one point I want to make um, very quickly, and that is this. So I know that earlier I said that your potential clients don't usually type in basic keywords. And let me first say that words like immigration attorney or immigration lawyer, those are keywords related to your practice. But competing for rank with those keywords alone can be astronomically um, astronomically difficult, both in organic search and if you choose to do pay-per-click advertising. Legal terms are notoriously among the most expensive and, and sought after. So how, how can a small law firm rank for those kinds of terms? And the answer to that is by adding those terms to long tail keywords um, and phrases and using those long tail keywords in specific places on law firm websites and blogs. Here is a quick doodle I did that explains why long tail keywords are effective for immigration firms. Long tail keywords are those that are incorporated into a more complex question or phrase that narrows the window and creates a more specific search. And this is really how many people search online. What this diagram illustrates is the value in going after long tail keywords. So on the walk y-axis we have the degree of competition and cost for a keyword and the higher on the y-axis the higher the cost the higher the competition for such a keyword on the x-axis we have the likelihood that a potential client converts or in this case contacts your firm the further left you are the less likely an individual is to convert let's look at a single word phrase like we see here in green attorney. So this is a very, very non-specific keyword for which there is a lot of competition, not a lot of likelihood for conversion. Nobody in their right mind types in the word attorney and then scrolls through pages and pages of results. Now if we get slightly more specific with immigration attorney um, or Arizona deportation defense, um, th these kinds of two to three word phrases that you see in, in orange here. This is more specific than attorney, but it's still a highly sought after term. It's maybe only slightly more likely to convert somebody who searches for it. And again, as I said, potential clients usually don't search this way. Now let's look at the part in blue. Here we have some highly specific descriptive phrases. These are the kinds of questions that your potential clients are likely to ask. These have a much higher likelihood of converting people because they directly address the kinds of questions that your potential clients are asking. There is far less competition for these terms and there are millions of long tail keyword phrases that you can target. With so much competition for some popular keywords, it is nearly impossible to have a new law firm website that ranks organically for those popular terms. And if you pay to compete for those terms through disposable advertising like pay-per-click, you may be paying a lot of money to compete for web visitors who may or may not click on your ads and may or may not be potential clients for your firm. Um, with pay-per-click, once you have spent the money on that and somebody clicks on it, it's gone whether that person is a potential client or not, whether it's your competition, whether it's an accidental click. Um, once the money is gone, it's gone. Attorneys need to also consider that your potential clients have ad blindness. In the time that we live in, people are so bombarded with messages every single day that a lot of times they don't even see them anymore. And of course, ad blockers have made it easier than ever for people to ignore ads, even outside of regular ad blindness. Um, that's sort of a new element in the mix and that you may well be trying to advertise to people who are never even going to see your ads in the first place. Now, I'm sure there are some of you that have this question, and that is, can my law firm only compete for long tail keywords? And the answer to that is no. Um, there are small law firms that rank very well for popular law firm keywords, um, ones like immigration attorney. But how they got there is often a byproduct of publishing lots of original, useful content that is related to those terms. And that content is likely in the form of um, long tail keywords and phrases. So for example, a small immigration firm may not be able to compete for a term like immigration attorney, but that attorney can compete for related searches um, when you write a significant volume of content that addresses questions um, such as some of those that we've previously discussed here and that you see here in blue. And what's great about this is that you're not only optimizing for the 
extremely specific phrase itself, but you also end up optimizing for the basic attorney-related terms that it contains. The other thing I should mention here is that one of the major things that Google's been working on right now um, with algorithms like RankBrain and others is the artificial intelligence aspect of search, particularly understanding intent. So when a potential client makes a search like this one, um, or even one that doesn't necessarily use words like immigration or immigration attorney, Google is trying to understand if this person may be looking for an immigration attorney's assistance. So, now that we have talked about how all of this actually works, let's talk a little bit about some SEO-related myths. Um, this is one of those areas where attorneys often get tripped up and there is no reason for them to. So now that you understand a little bit more about how the internet works and how your potential clients use search engines, the reasons why these myths don't make sense and can actually cost your firm a lot of wasted time and wasted money, um, I think will start to make sense to you. So the first myth that I want to address is what happens when someone promises that they can provide you with quick results. And by that I mean somebody telling you that you can rank for an incredibly popular keyword in a few weeks, these kinds of promises. Even the very best law firm SEO strategist doesn't have any control over what Google or what any other search engine does. Um, and building up your content does take some time. It's not a one and done magical sort of process and it's something that you're always going to be working on and continually adding to. So if somebody tells you that they can get your law firm to the, the quote unquote top of Google in three weeks, there is just no way. And that also brings me to my next point, which is the promise of the top of Google. I hate to break it to everybody, there is no such thing. Um, these two things are related to each other and that they have to do with the myth of overnight success. Um, so let me explain this a little further. For any Google search that you make, we know there is a number one ranking position, but there is no top of Google. If you search for a basic keyword phrase such as immigration attorney Los Angeles, the results that you'll receive are going to be different and they're going to be different based on the day that you search, the location that you search from, the browser that you're using, um, the device that you're searching on, and that's among other factors. And for any potential client who does a search like this, um, just about the only thing that's going to be the same about each of those searches for your potential clients is that they're all going to be different. To assume that potential clients search for basic keyword phrases like the one we just discussed assumes that they know they need an attorney and search exactly for those terms. And now we know that is not always the case. Potential clients often search by asking Google questions about their matter. And those questions may include basic keyword terms, but those basic terms are often, as we have learned, nestled into long tail phrases. And a majority of daily searches are completely unique. For each unique search, you're going to get a unique set of search results. The next myth is that SEO for immigration attorneys is complicated or that you don't have the time to learn it. And that, of course, is untrue. Um, you're going to learn a large part of what you need to know today just by sitting here. And as you can see, what is more complicated than writing content is trying to struggle and struggle with methods and tactics that don't work and that are based on false assumptions. That is far more complicated than taking the time to um, know what works right now um, from the beginning and building on that foundation. Next up is the special relationship with Google myth. Um, this is one that comes up every once in a while and that's whether somebody is cold calling your firm to tell you that they have a special relationship with Google and they can can get you to the top of Google in a week, um, or that they know something special about a Google algorithm update. Um, all of that is nonsense. Now let me say that as a marketer, you can be a Google partner. You can resell Google products like PPC ads or Google apps, but none of those things are going to help you as the immigration attorney with your SEO. Last myth is that there is a secret to ranking well. Um, like I said, Google's ranking factors and their relative weights are a secret, but what is absolutely not a secret and what has never been a secret is that Google wants you to write lots of quality content for your website so that they can provide it to people who are making queries. 
they want to provide the best content. That is what they are looking for. So when you write useful, insightful content um, that's really meaty and helps your potential clients, and when you do that on a regular basis, Google is paying attention to that and can ultimately reward you with better placement and search engine results. So I think the only secret that there might be is that content is really the key, and if you're not writing it, your competitors are going to. Here are some other common myths, and these ones are old. Um, they sort of date back to the early days of the search engines, but they are incredibly persistent for some reason, so I bring them up. Uh, the first is keyword meta tags. So early on, meta tags were actually an important part of the SEO process. And for those of you who don't remember this, what you would do at that time is you would include the keyword meta tags that you wanted your site to rank for, and those pages would come up in results for relevant searches. Unfortunately, this process was quickly used and abused by spammers, and so much so that it got dropped as an important signal because that frustrated users who were looking for actual information, um, and what these spammers were doing was in direct conflict with what Google is trying to do. Google does not have a business if they cannot provide people with the best search results for the questions that they have, and it's why they've worked so hard on algorithm updates to ensure that people who are trying to cheat or game the system can't do so. More web pages being equivalent to better ranking. So not only is this myth untrue, it's one of those that can really harm your law firm's web presence. More pages not always equivalent to a better search engine ranking. Now, there are large law firm websites that do rank well with search engines, and those law firm websites do have thousands and thousands of pages. But the key difference here is that those pages are filled with useful content for potential clients, and they've been built up with that content over time. People didn't sort of hastily slap these pages together. They were carefully crafted to provide potential clients with the information that's the most important to them. A website can be large in terms of the number of pages that it has, but if you're simply adding pages without good content to support them, um, that can be a real recipe for trouble. Publishing a lot of pages without the quality content necessary to bolster those pages and to make them valuable to web users is really unlikely to bring your law from better rankings, and in fact, it can actually even hurt your rankings. I pulled this quote from Google's Webmaster Guidelines, which I absolutely recommend that all attorneys go and check out, um, and the quote is this. It says, one of the most important steps in improving your site's ranking in Google search results is to ensure that it contains plenty of rich information that includes relevant keywords used appropriately that indicate the subject matter of your content. However, some webmasters attempt to improve their page's ranking and attract visitors by creating pages with many words but little or no authentic content. Google will take action against domains that try to rank more highly just by showing scraped or other cookie cutter pages that don't add substantial value to users. So this should be important to you because it's important to Google. Um, I absolutely recommend, as I said, that attorneys go to check out Google's webmaster guidelines. If you Google it, it will come up. Um, it's really important to stay on the, the right side of what Google is asking. There's a, a phrase here that sort of says that inclusion is a privilege and not a right. So um, make sure that you're up to date on what Google is asking of you. The next bullet here is for overvaluing keywords or keyword stuffing, and this, again, very persistent myth that causes attorneys to struggle. And whether that's a matter of obsessing over the top keywords or stuffing keywords into your web pages, this is another one of those things that can damage your web presence. And for those of you who aren't familiar, keyword stuffing has to do with the myth of keyword density. People think that how many times a keyword shows up on a page has everything to do with how search engines determine um, the page's relevancy and ranking, and it, it's simply not true. Um, this is one of those myths that has been proven not to be true over and over again, but there are still SEO providers who push this myth. Okay, last one, that page search helps organic results. Um, spending money on pay-per-click advertising is unlikely to improve your organic rankings. In fact, search engines have actually done work to ensure that this doesn't happen. Um, there is no special access or consideration that's provided um, by search 
search engines for those who spend money, or as it often happens with law firm keywords more and more money um, on paid search. Okay, so we've covered a lot of the big myths that surround online legal marketing. Let's go back to the big thing that your website needs, and that is content. Immigration attorneys, whether they know it or not, have a content problem, and it's illustrated by this little diagram here. To do successful online legal marketing, an intrinsic part of that, of engaging potential clients and getting business online, is content. You need content, you likely need a lot of it. And if you haven't been to our website, we have a free um, webinar section that carefully details what you need to do to plan your content, to blog, to write for the web. Um, so feel free to check those out. But the point here is that you need content, so you're going to have to make some decision, decisions about that. If you want to write your own content, that's great. And at Lawlytics, we can show you how to write it the right way um, in the way that will attract your potential clients. So if you want to write it, that's fantastic. Now, if you're not going to write it, that puts you in one of two positions. Either you've got to delegate it to somebody else, and you've got to delegate it the right way to someone who understands um, the law, to someone who understands what you do as an immigration attorney. You do that, you'll be in good shape. The alternative is that you don't delegate. And the longer you wait to do that, um, the longer you wait to write, the longer you wait to engage your potential clients who are looking for you online, uh, the more time you're wasting and the more opportunities you're missing. And your competitors are going to be getting ahead writing the content that you are not. So we see it as axiomatic. You need content. It just comes down to deciding who is going to write that content. In the content that you'll write, an under underlying goal should be to compel your potential clients to reach out to you. And the way to do that isn't simply to say, call my law firm now, but it's to connect to them through your writing. Your content should inspire confidence in them that you know what you're talking about and that you're the right attorney to assist them in their matter, that they can trust you. After all, people who seek immigration attorneys may be frustrated or worried about their future or their family or their job, um, and your potential client needs to know that if they choose you, they can really trust you to work and fight for the best possible outcome. You're also trying to convey sameness. Your potential clients aren't just looking for an attorney. They need a human who also practices the law and really understands their problem and gets where they're coming from and um, has empathy for their situation. So. Here is what your content should do. It should show your potential clients that you know what you're talking about, so establishing subject matter expertise. And you can do that both in your website's substantive content um, and also on blog posts, which we'll talk about in just a moment. But make sure that you do it in a way that a layperson can understand. Keep in mind that your potential clients may not come from a legal background, and while you are familiar with the terms of art, if you will, um, they are not. And legalese can be confusing and frustrating. Show them that you're passionate and interested in them and their problem. And part of that is publishing new content on a regular basis. Um, as I see it, nothing says I am not interested in what I do, like a blog that's been abandoned or a website that doesn't have new content that's published um, often. And they also need to understand that the problem that they're facing is complex, um, but it's one that you are uniquely suited to help them solve. Content is not just limited to text. It can show up in a lot of different forms. And these are the basic structural elements that you'll feature on your website. The text, of course, is the most basic part of your website. And before you start delving into bells and whistles like video and audio, um, it's important to have a strong, well-established foundation of text content. Once that is established, then you can start thinking about enhancements like infographics and video, which do add to your web presence and can be helpful educational tools for your potential clients. But that written content foundation has to come first. So there are three basic kinds of content. There is blog content. There is substantive content. It's also sometimes referred to as evergreen content. And lastly, there's reputational content. And each of these are different from each other, and they serve different purposes. So we're going to talk about why that is and why you need to develop each of these. And let's start with blog content. So whether the idea of blogging for your law firm is completely new to you or 
you know that you need to and you haven't gotten around to it yet, blogging is one of the most efficient and effective ways to market your firm for a number of reasons. Having a blog for your immigration firm helps your firm stay relevant. So many potential clients use the web to find their attorney and a lack of participation online can really raise some red flags for potential clients. They expect to be able to find you online. They expect to find that you are participating in the online discussion. And blogging on a regular basis allows you to consistently connect with potential clients um, while creating discourse about a variety of topics. It helps to answer the questions that clients have. It helps to build that bond of trust. Now, if you are an attorney who is worried about traffic, worried about rankings, um, worried about search engine optimization, you are not alone. A lot of lawyers are. And one question that we often get here at Lawlytics is from those attorneys who ask us, my SEO strategy doesn't seem to be working. How can I improve my traffic and my rankings? And a follow-up question that we often ask is, how often are you blogging? When SEO strategy isn't working, what it can often be attributed to is a lack of blogging. And that's whether that's just infrequent blogging or no blogging at all. By writing blogs on a regular basis, you can improve your traffic. The more quality content that you write, the more opportunities that Google's spiders or bots or crawlers or whatever you want to call them, um, the more opportunities they see to come back to your website and index that new material, material for relevant searches. And they're always looking for new material. Blogging also makes you and your firm unique. It helps to build relationships with potential clients. It sets you apart from lawyers who aren't blogging. But Above all, it's a place to show your potential clients that you care about the questions that they're asking and that you're devoting individual blog posts to answering those questions. It gives you a space to give your opinion, to make commentary, and to keep people returning to your website as well. Here is another thing that attorneys will want to consider about blogging. There is an increasing number of small law firms that are getting eaten up by larger firms, and you're going to want a way to make sure that your presence is unique and priceless, even in the face of a merger. And that's where thought leadership comes in. Blogging isn't just an appreciating asset for your law firm, it's a personal asset too. Because if it comes time to trim the fat when a merger happens, a law firm may not cut an individual who has amassed a large following with a blog. Blogs really establish you as a thought leader. It establishes you as somebody who is an authority in their field and uniquely influential. Because blogs are highly effective in connecting with potential clients and turning them into your clients, um, a blog is a major asset for your law firm, for you, for your financial security, um, and ultimately for your future. So now that you know a little bit more about blogging, keep in mind that at the Lawlytics website, we have a lot of free resources for you to look at um, if you need blog topic inspiration or maybe you're ready to start thinking about content planning. Um, all of that is there for you to see. So we'll revisit blogging a little bit later as well. Let's move on to substantive content. So substantive content, um, as the name might suggest, is the meat of your website. This is also sometimes referred to as evergreen content because it's the content that's going to remain consistent and consistently relevant for your readership for a long time. Here are some of the areas that constitute substantive pages. And they can really be divided into two categories. The first is pages that are about you. So the about your firm page, your attorney bio or bios if you have more than one attorney, um, your office location or locations plural, recommendations from happy former clients, and other things like case results that demonstrate your capability. The second category is the pages that are about your potential clients and about the, um, the matter that they're facing. That includes practice area pages, the pages that detail important aspects about the law in the place where you live, um, local pages that help you strategically target your specific local audience, um, frequently asked questions pages that help with things like client expectation management and case studies. So let's start with this topic about your firm. A lot of times we see about your firm pages that are very conservative, maybe just a series of facts about the firm. 
that is not very engaging to your potential clients. So think about how on your firm's page, and, and this is aside from the individual bio pages, how are you going to refer to yourself? Are you going to talk about yourself in the first person? Are you going to choose third person? And are there benefits? Well, there are, there are benefits and drawbacks to each. I actually wrote a blog post about this in, in mid-November about when you may want to choose first or second or third person. So um, feel free to check that out over at the Lawlytics blog if you need some help deciding or you're curious about the various considerations. Um, but as you're writing this page, ask yourself if it really sets you apart from other immigration attorneys. What makes your firm unique? What's your unique selling proposition or USP? Does it get to the heart of who you are? Does it let your audience get to know you? And that takes us to a related page, which is your attorney bio. So the attorney bio is one of the most visited and the most important pages on your site. And it can be a powerful business generator, but only when it's written the right way. So that requires some thought. One thing we see that often happens with attorney bios is that attorneys are tempted to rattle off a long list of facts about their educational history um, or their accolades and awards and, and so on and so forth. And there's a place for that and there's a way to do that. But the trick with attorney bios is to not talk about your accomplishments in the way that you might to another attorney, um, but to think about this in the context of what it means to your potential client. So let's take a look at what your potential client actually cares about. It is important to understand how your potential clients and your referral sources approach the information that they're consuming about you. So before your potential clients or referral sources consider things like your accomplishments, they want to know a little bit more about you as a person. Um, there's that old saying that says that people won't care about what you know until they know how much you care. And here this is very fitting. So aside from knowing how much you care about what you do, potential clients want to know how enthusiastic you are, um, how intense is your interest in your practice, in them, um, in the problem that they're facing. And once they know that you care about them, and that you care about what you do, then they want to know about what you've done. So here's a way to think about this. First, write about your journey to the law. You need to show your potential clients that you care about them, their matter, and your practice. So consider answering some of the following questions. How did you get to where you are right now? Why is it that you chose to handle the, the, the cases that you do? The types of matters that your potential client wonders if you can help them with. What inspired you to become a lawyer? What inspired your career path? Um, what happened during your formative years to make you decide that you wanted to practice the law? What motivates you as an attorney and as a person? And here, the, the deeper that you can dig for things that motivate you outside of just winning or making money, um, the more you can make it about your potential client and your success being dependent on the valuable benefit that you provide to potential clients, the more relatable that you make yourself to those potential clients. It's about things like getting clients through difficult situations with, with peace of mind. So ask yourself, what drives you to do it and what inspires you? Who do you surround yourself with? And potential clients want to know who you surround yourself with, and not just in the law, though that's, that's important too, but also in your life. So what kind of extracurricular activities are you a part of? Do you support some kind of youth group? Are you a member of charities? Um, how do you give back to the community? What helps you define yourself outside of the law? People will often read more into who you are based on the company that you keep more than anything that you say on your bio. Who have you helped? So Lawlytics provides a special module for doing your attorney bios and a separate special module for case results. Um, we also have a separate special module for um, recommendations from clients and peers, but that's not exactly what we're talking about here. Your attorney bio isn't a place for discussion individual matters, but instead to discuss them more generally. So think about the type of person that you typically help. You want to paint a picture of who you've helped and why you enjoy doing that. And then lastly, what have you done? So here's a place to talk about what you've accomplished in your law career and your education. 
what qualifies you. And this can be honors, case results, publications, but the, the thing here is that attorneys tend to just list these things. So instead of just listing them, talk about what it means to you. So take a publication, for example. Talk about what it means to you to have been selected, how the selection process worked, um, why it's a big deal, give it some context. So for example, maybe you've been selected as a top lawyer in your area by a local magazine. Um, tell your readers what went into that, what was the criteria, how do they define it, um, and what does it mean to you? So remember that what may be obvious to you is not necessarily obvious to your potential client, especially if they don't have a legal background. And the reality is that many potential clients don't understand um, the various terms that attorneys use to compare themselves to one another. So, um, for example, if you are AV rated, it's good to explain what that means. If you've got a perfect score of 10 on AVO. What does it mean? What have you done to earn it? How many clients have you helped? Um, what do you typically do during the process? And this is not an exhaustive list by any means, but the more of these things that you write about in your attorney bio, the more ideas you'll have for other things to talk about as well. Office location pages. Okay, so an office location page sounds simple, and they can be, but they can also be much more than just an address and a phone number. Your potential clients, of course, need to know your address and they need to know your phone number. But think about giving them the extra information that they need. They need maps, they need to know if you have multiple locations, um, maybe you've got different attorneys at each location, they need to know that too. They need to know um, who and what to expect when they go to a location. Then consider adding the relevant facts. So how do you get there? Will they need their parking validated? Are there certain landmarks that they should be looking for? Is your office on a side street that's hard to find? Um, and be sure to add pictures too, because that makes things much more comfortable for your potential clients. As you create this content, you make an impression on your potential client that you care about making it as easy as possible for them to find you and to get what they need. Recommendations. Recommendations are important points of proof, and there is no better way of proving to your potential clients and your referral sources that you can do a good job for them than by having other people say that you've done a good job in the past. And you'll want to write a good lead into your recommendations page, but you can also add something to each recommendation that makes it more than just somebody saying you did a good job. Um, you'll want to add some context to that recommendation. So as an example, Let's say that someone writes a nice recommendation about you, but it's pretty non-specific. Maybe it's like, I chose this attorney and they did a great job for me, thank you so much. Um, add some extra details with the recommendation that explains the context and gives more substance to that very non-specific recommendation. Um, that'll give it more weight, it helps it, it make more sense to the potential client who's reading it. An important aspect of writing better case results is understanding what they're meant to do, not just what they're supposed to contain. When you know what purpose your case results serve, that's the point at which you can write these very compelling stories that humanize you and that drive potential clients to reach out to you. As I said earlier, with so many of the pages on your site, your case results should inspire confidence, they should engender trust, and they should convey sameness between you and your potential client. Your potential clients are going to read those case results with themselves in mind. They will put themselves into the shoes of the clients that are the subject of your results. So that's why more than just listing the outcome, um, it's important to explain why you fought so hard and why it matters in the context of the client that you helped. So let's look at an example of how exactly to tell a compelling story. So start with the facts. Here's an example. And let me say first, of course, that I'm not an immigration attorney, but you'll get the idea from, from what I'm saying. So let's say that in this hypothetical situation, you've got an employer who has someone coming over on an employment visa and they've got everything in order, but um, the current administration just signed a new order that happens to target the employee's home country, maybe somewhere in the Middle East. 
Describe your client's frustrations. Um, make the situation that your client is facing real and relatable to the person who's reading the story. Um, what was at stake? Why is it that, as an attorney, you felt the need to take this matter and put your energy into it? Um, what were you fighting for? What were the motivations of your client? What were your motivations? Um, where do those motivations intersect? Your potential clients want to know that your motivations are in alignment with theirs. It's part of the, sort of part of the how much do you care part of the pyramid. Then explain the challenges. So this is where your enthusiasm comes in. What were the odds and the obstacles that you faced in this matter? How did you prepare for it? And this isn't just a matter of saying what you did, but it's also explaining how you got there. Um, when attorneys talk just about the conclusion, your potential clients may not understand just how much work went into the final result. And as you're talking about how you prepared, talk about why you cared about their problem so much that it becomes clear to the reader that you also care about their problem. Next up is the quest. So the, the details really matter, and that's regardless of what kind of matter you're dealing with. The details go a long way toward convincing potential clients that you are the right person to help them with their problem. And as a side note, you don't necessarily want to put your bio here, but you can connect your client's story to your bio in a way that ties things together nicely without restating it. Um, you may want to include a link to your attorney bio. Lastly is the result. So this is often where most lawyers start when they talk about success stories. But without understanding the facts, without understanding the challenges, um, without understanding the journey that you took to get that result, potential clients may not understand this part without some context. So once you've built up those other elements, talk about your results. And don't just talk about the legal result. Talk about how the result impacted your client. Like in this example, let's say the employer came to you and they were really concerned about all this recent federal action and they weren't sure if it was going to affect their plan to um, bring this new employee here. And you were able to examine the legislation and counsel this employer as to the best course of action. And now the employee is able to enter the country. So the, the deeper that you go, the more relatable it is to your potential clients. But the end result doesn't just benefit your potential client. After you talk about those general results, talk about how it better armed you to serve clients in the future. So how did this case continue to prepare you for the next potential client? Your previous successes as an attorney are important points of social proof. And they can inspire potential clients to have confidence in your work, to engage you, and ultimately to hire you. So to sum this up, case results, when they're written correctly, can be even more valuable than recommendations from your former clients and from other lawyers. But unfortunately, attorneys often list case results on their law firm websites as these one or two line summaries that may not mean a whole lot to your potential clients and don't necessarily encourage them to reach out to you. But if you write your case results the right way, they can become these really powerful stories that speak to your potential clients and inspire them to seek your assistance. What we see most often on law firm websites is a single page list. So many results, not a lot of detail. And you know, in other areas, things like victories, verdict amounts, these things don't mean a whole lot to potential clients out of context. So when you're writing your results, really think about a compelling story that's going to encourage potential clients to, to contact your law firm. Practice area pages. This is an area in which um, Rachel's going to discuss in detail a little bit later, but this is really where a lot of attorney websites begin. We recommend going a whole lot deeper than just the practice area pages. So. For your practice area, you want to describe it in terms that a layperson can understand. Then you want to give a simple overview of each area, then drill down into the specifics. What that gives your potential clients is a choice. It lets them choose how they want to consume that content. Do they want just a basic overview of something, or maybe they want to read the basic overview, and then they want to know something very specific about the problem that they're facing. And that leads us to detailed law pages. So this is where you're drilling down into the detailed pages. And you can spend a lot of time and a lot of words here getting more and more specific. 
I encourage attorneys um, not to be discouraged by the idea that potential clients are only going to read a tiny portion of what you write. You want to give them that choice. You want to let them choose how they want to consume that content. So if they read a basic overview and they're satisfied with what they find there, at that point their exit is to contact you. Or maybe they keep drilling down and drilling down into the content until they've read everything there is to read and that's the point at which they decide that you're the right attorney for them. But it's important to give them that choice and to build up a really robust collection of information. And don't think that any question or any topic isn't right for your website because if you've had even one client in the past who has asked about something, there are many more people out there who may be curious about the same thing um, and are searching for those answers online and they need somebody who can answer that question for them. Local pages. So one of the best things that attorneys can do to address people in local markets is to create pages that they can relate to. And the further you're able to hone in on local information, the more relevant it is for potential clients and, and so forth. So with Lawlytics, you can easily put in pictures and maps um, where you can create these pages. And the mechanics are a little bit beyond this webinar. Um, I will say we do have a specific local pages webinar that you can check out. But when you create these pages, think about what happens in various places. Um, and Rachel's going to talk about this a little bit more in depth shortly. But you want to provide your potential clients with as much information as is useful to them. So for example, for an immigration attorney, what can you tell potential clients about things like ports of entry or detention centers or things like that? So. Every page on your website should really address the questions that your potential clients have, but frequently asked questions pages are special in that they can do a number of different things on one page, so don't overlook the value of this kind of page. If you're sitting across the table from one of your potential clients, you know that you learn a lot about the questions that they have, you learn about their goals, you learn about their concerns, their fears, and these are the same kinds of things that can go on a frequently asked questions page. A good frequently asked questions page helps your visibility, but what it also does is that it can answer several questions at once. So you can devote an entire page or an entire post to one problem, and you can link those pages within your frequently asked questions page, but you can also provide other questions and answers that may be relevant and may be of interest to your potential clients who are on that page now. Another good thing that a page like this can do is helping to manage client expectations. So it can help increase productivity at your firm first. When clients have questions, a good page like this can act as a resource that you can provide them with. But it can also assist with client expectations to help prevent surprises. So you can address questions about timelines, fees, um, maybe what's expected during an office visit, and that sort of transparency can help to manage those expectations. Um, when client expectations do not align with your services, that's where problems can arise. So an immigration attorney may find a potential client who expects a certain outcome because of a perception that they have about how the process works, or maybe they knew someone in a similar situation and they expect the outcome and timeline will, will work exactly the same for them. And a frequently asked questions page can address those issues. It can also address smaller issues such as how quickly your law firm returns phone calls or emails. Um, but again, it can counter issues with potential clients who may have unrealistic expectations um, and those sorts of things. So it's important from the perspective of a potential new client um, to not only understand that you know about what their problem is um, or what their matter is and how to solve it, but that you've done things that are relevant to their case in the past or at least that you understand it. Most prospective clients won't understand the nuance and the legalese, but they do respond well to detailed fact patterns. So one thing that you can do is take published cases or lower court opinions that aren't necessarily published but are accessible and then take those fact patterns from the opinions and lay them out in individual pages and then answer the questions about why this happened, the procedure, um, and then you can even make up hypothetical fact patterns and talk about how the law works in regard to those. Your potential clients are going to look through those fact patterns and they are going to find things that relate to them or that resonate with them. This is an exercise that takes a lot of time 
and it takes some effort, but it is well worth it, and not only for your potential clients, but for the search engines as well that are looking for this kind of relevant material to provide to potential clients who are asking questions related to it. So we've talked about substantive or evergreen pages. We've talked about blog posts. We've talked about reputational content, like your about pages. There is one more kind of page I want to briefly touch upon before I hand this over to Rachel, and that is a landing page. So landing pages are designed to bring in targeted traffic with a specific goal. So whether that is to contact your firm, whether that is to download something like an ebook, whether it is to get on your mailing list, whatever it is, this page is for that specific goal. It is designed to convert the visitor into completing whatever you decide the user action is. Now, the benefits of building specific landing pages, which you can do in Lawlytics, is this. You convert at higher percentages, and that's because instead of casting a wide net with traditional forms of advertising where you hope to attract potential clients and you hope to attract clients that are a good fit for your firm, um, landing pages can narrow the scope a little bit in a way that benefits your potential client. They find exactly the sort of information that they're looking for and it benefits your immigration firm and that you begin to build that bond of trust with them and start building that relationship before you've ever met face to face. Landing pages also remove distractions, and that is a big deal. Now, you can have a call to action on a regular page, that's great, but if you want to drive traffic specifically to your site to take a specific action and to make sure that th this person is more likely a good fit for what you're looking for, the best thing to do is to remove distractions, um, and landing pages accomplish that. You want to give your potential clients some specific clear instructions, and a landing page with no distractions um, designed for one specific task can do that very well. And the overall effect of this is that you can really drive down the cost of your advertising when you are being strategic with these landing pages. So that is all I have to say about that. I'm now going to turn it over to Rachel and she's going to tell you um, some more specific information about content for immigration attorneys. Rachel? Thank you very much, Victoria. So as Dan mentioned earlier, I prior to joining Lawlytics, I practiced criminal defense in Pennsylvania. And I now oversee the Lawlytics content department. My team works with our attorney clients to plan, create, and refine their web content. So as you're getting started, one of the most helpful things you can do before even planning what content will go on your new site is to take some time and really think about the audience for whom you will be writing. Who are you attempting to target? And what are the general demographic characteristics of your audience? What will be the mindset of a visitor coming to your site? Are you attempting to target um, maybe a nonprofit refugee organization who needs consultation from time to time? Are you more focused on targeting individuals who are seeking to relocate to the U.S. for employment, or um, maybe citizens who are interested in having their family members come over to the states? So thinking about this and then thinking about how this will inform your tone. And it's a really good idea to create what you think will be your internal guidelines as far as writing for your site. And, and write those down somewhere, save those, so that as you move forward, when you start to grow and you have, might have more people or different people writing for the site, you kind of can come back to that. And those will be your guiding principles as far as the voice that you want to portray on your site. And then you're going to have concerns about language. And those might take a few different forms. So typically, we advise attorneys to think about their local language and think about how people in their area speak. You know, if there are colloquial terms that are used, how locations are referred to, it's really important to be keeping that in mind so that you're writing the content for your site as though you, in the way that you would speak. But when we're dealing with a lot of immigration firms, there are, there's another layer of language concerns, and that is getting your content translated to the appropriate languages that you need. So this can, this can be done in a variety of ways, and it's a good idea to kind of think about it when you're early on in the process. Um, 
it, you know, you, it might be that you have a you work in a very specific market, and let's say you you have two, you know, you're going to do two versions of your site, you know, one in English and one in a targeted additional language, such as Spanish. Um, also, you might want to install something like the Google Translate feature so the visitors can view your whole site in any particular selected language. So it's just a good, thinking of those concerns early on is just good and you're setting sort of a roadmap for where you want to go. And drilling down on the audience you're seeking to serve will be of so much greater help than attempting to find any type of, you know, vague, one-size-fits-all advice about writing for the web or SEO. So an unnecessary stumbling block for the firm just starting out can often be content. How much content do I need? What is enough? And I think it's really important to stress that we don't feel you need to invest a significant amount of time or money in creating a content that is necessary to get you started, to get your site launched. Um, when we're working with clients who are launching a new site, we focus on creating what we call the structural content. And that includes a homepage bio and about our firm pages that Victoria spoke about earlier. And we also include a few substantive practice area pages. And at this point, we plan for these pages to kind of serve as a broad overview of the particular topic. We recommend that prior to launching your site, you do cover each type of case or each legal service that you offer on your site. And these pages should provide sufficient information that a potential client with no knowledge of the service or the type of case before would be able to walk away with it with a basic understanding. You're kind of describing, for example, you know, if you're talking about visas, you would describe the person as far as the circumstances that they might be in. You know, you're looking to come to the United States to study in a particular field or you're looking to come to the United States to work permanently, coming for a short amount of time, and then you talk about the requirements, and finally that page should, be end, should end with a call to action where you talk about how your firm can provide unique or the best um, services related to this particular need that someone might have. And when you're getting started out, we recommend that these pages be around 500 words on the shorter side, and about a thousand words on the longer side so that you do cover everything in depth. Um, also, and, and I know this was mentioned earlier, but we, when we're planning to launch a site, when we construct a plan for an initial content build, we always include an FAQ page because as, as you heard earlier, it can serve a multitude of purposes, it gives your site a boost with search engines, and it's an excellent a way to give you ideas for creating full pages that you're writing in the future as you're growing your web presence. So when you're starting out, we recommend just having a general practice area, FAQ at launch. And then as you move forward, drilling down to more specific FAQ pages for different practice areas once your site is growing. So even if you're very new to this particular practice area, um, we, we always encourage you to be thinking long term. So when you're deciding on which pages you'd initially want to add to your site, think about how you're eventually going to want to grow your site and flesh those pages out. And the reason why we start a new site with legal practice area pages that sort of serve as a broad overview is as the website grows, what we're going to do is we're going to add subpages that go into much greater detail on particular topics under those pages. So at the beginning, the pages are standalone. But as the site evolves, they become parent pages with child items nested underneath them. So for example, here to launch a site, we might include a page that's just titled Visas. And it briefly covers different types of visas, why someone would need that type of visa, and that type of thing. However, as the site grows, what we're going to do is we're going to break out each one of those visa types and create child pages. Now the standalone visa page converts to a parent page with those child items nested underneath. And of course, we would, like I mentioned previously, going from a general FAQ to more specific topical FAQ. So we would also probably add a visa FAQ page under there as well. So if you're creating your site or thinking about planning your site on another platform, um, growth might be something that you want to consider taking the time and sitting down with your web developer to discuss. Because sometimes, depending on how the site, you know, 
is built with the site architecture, you might need to know where you're eventually going to go heavy in a particular area so that things such as your navigation menu, that can be planned for. Um, however, if you're currently on the Wallalytics platform or that's something you plan to do, this isn't um, a step you need to take early on in the process. It's very, very easy to add subpages to a practice area page and change the structure. Um, and all of anything that you do will automatically populate in your navigation menu. So it gives you a lot of flexibility if you're not entirely sure exactly where you're going to go and where you're going to be expanding the most. And the one thing I do want to caution against here is if, if, if you're in the position of getting ready to launch a new site and you don't really have time to create many individual pages, what we do really recommend that you do is, like I said, the cluster technique, sort of lumping all of the visas together on one page. Um, because what we see sometimes is people might, um, you know, title a page, uh, you know, family immigration, and the page only says something like, you know, do you, do you have a loved one that you want to bring to the United States? We have years of experience assisting people with immigration matters. Contact us today. Um, now, this, this doesn't really address the hierarchy of needs that Victoria um, introduced earlier, and it, doesn't, it does, definitely doesn't establish you as an authority on that particular topic, and it, it kind of shows that what you're most interested in is, is not providing the user information that they were seeking, but information about you and your firm. So again, that's something, while we don't think a stumbling block should be a great deal of content, um, we also don't think you should throw a bunch of pages on there just to have them and without them being flushed out. So finding a good middle ground is what we advocate for. And so I think um, the start phase is really, really exciting because when you launch a site or you're opening a new firm, or you're offering services in a new practice area, one of the best things you can do is start collecting data from day one. And you know, with a new site, you might not be getting a ton of visitors, so measuring traffic might not be where you're starting to track, but there are many, many other data sets that you can take a look at, and this can really help to inform you and inform your marketing and where you're going to go. Um, so what you can do is look at things such as, as trends. And, I mean, I we, we say this, for attorneys who are practicing in any any practice area, but I, I don't think there's any practice area where there's a stark, as much of a stark example than immigration as what we're seeing right now. I mean, on a, on a, on a national scale, this might not be local things, but it does definitely have a lot of, it. we're seeing a ton of impact on different cities, or sanctuary cities, and we're seeing a lot of really, really quick changes in this area. Um, so keeping an eye on trends, on what you see happening, on what might be happening that you didn't anticipate. Um, for example, if you practice in a city with a lot of universities and, you know, current administration policies are really making different departments and in a variety of universities unsure of, you know, people they're planning to have come as visiting professors, people who are coming to do medical research, people coming to do research in the social sciences, and you're finding, you know, more and more requests for consultations for things like that. Um, you know, the same thing if you're a private sector, you might see an uptick in, in people who just want advice, you know, we're looking to start, you know, a, a new department, a new R&D department, and how might this year sort of change where we can get our workforce? Should we be not looking internationally? Should we be looking domestically? That type of thing really keeping an eye on that and tracking the types of cases that you seem to be getting can help inform your marketing strategy. If you see an uptick in a particular thing or if you see an increased flow from a particular area, that's definitely something that you can turn. Um, you know, feel free to pivot and, and really focus in that particular area. Again, just looking at the data that you're collecting. And also, I, I know I've mentioned it several times and you heard about it earlier, but collecting those questions that you're asked the most often, um, that's really, really important because not only can it, you know, serve to inform 
like I said, the trends and where you see the most business, but also it helps you write those FAQ pages and it can really help serve as a roadmap for how you're growing your site. So one of the things we recommend people do, especially when you have partners, associates, um, support staff, is kind of creating a central place you know, if it's a shared Google document, that can work a lot of times. So that everyone can sort of contribute to that. It's a shared repository for your firm and the questions you're getting. You know, sometimes we see that attorneys aren't that dialed into the questions they're getting most often, especially when they have a robust and really great support staff who handle those. But it, so that's why it's a good idea to have a place where everyone can go and record those so you can see that data and be aware of what's going on. And I think I hit all of these, so we can go to the next one. So um, if you have any just more specific questions regarding content for your site, I really, really encourage you to reach out to um, our department. You can shoot us an email at writing at lawlytics.com or give us a call. Some of you might already be familiar with her, but Alyssa Rhodes is the Director of Content Services. And over the past couple years, we've helped many, many attorneys create content and launch their sites. So if you have a brief question or you want some help getting started, you're interested in additional resources or maybe just want some assistance kind of taking the step to plan for the long term, you reach out to us because we're more than happy to help. And then I just briefly want to mention the next webinar we'll be having in our practice area series, and that will be Grow Your Immigration Practice, and that's going to air on February 28th, and it will then be available on demand thereafter. And in this webinar, I'm going to discuss additional tools that you can use for long-term content strategy and planning. And then I'm going to talk about fleshing out the initial practice area pages that you wrote and we're also going to examine some lessons we've learned from successful growing immigration firms, as well as some common pitfalls to be aware of and to avoid. So if you are interested in taking that next step, I really encourage you to join us on the 28th or, or take a look at the webinar after we put it on demand. And now I'm going to go ahead and turn the mic back over to Victoria. Thanks, Rachel. So. Now that you understand how content works, there are a couple considerations that you're going to have to make. The first is how often. So how often will you be updating your evergreen content to include new pages? How often will you be publishing to your blog? And keep in mind that as I discussed previously, for blogging to benefit your firm, you've got to do it consistently. Um, blogging once a year or once a month is not enough to move the needle. There's some recent data from HubSpot that suggests that businesses who post more than 16 blogs in a month receive three and a half times more traffic than those who publish only up to four times a month. And it's reasonable to believe that that trend translates for attorneys as well. Anecdotally speaking, we see that attorneys who do blog more get more traffic. The second thing that you'll have to consider is what topics you'll write about. And the best way to do this is to have a con content plan that lays all of that out for you. As a reminder, we've got some nice content planning resources over on our website. The last question is knowing who is going to write your content. Is it going to be you or is it going to be a proxy writer? And either way, like I said before, you'll need content. The one last thing to remember um, is that if you're not writing your own content, or if you are writing your own content, rather, um, perfect is really the enemy of good. Um, or as Ali Sachs over at Iris PR had said, it's not a brief, it's a blog. Um, don't let perfectionism get in the way of getting your blogs or evergreen pages published. With that, let's move from the topic of content to the topic of website design, which is another important part of your web presence. And for that, I'm going to turn the mic over to Sophia Oliboni, who is our senior web designer. Sophia, good morning. Good morning, Victoria. Good morning, everyone. So what, I, what I'm going to do is kind of go over the basics of design as far as the things that you need to consider when developing a website. So first off, we're going to start off with the purpose of the website. Basically, design that fails to communicate is dead. 
that is the purpose of design is to communicate. And interactive media adds a new element to that communication because it's meant to be interacted with. It's not a it's not a post or a newspaper or a flyer. However, the internet is a relatively new form of media and problems with usability crop up when people think about the web in the same way that they long thought about print media. Attorneys may say that they want something above the fold, as they might with a newspaper, or they try to point out something that is at the top of the screen. The problem with that is when with web design it is not set up in the same terms of print. What is above the screen or above the fold um, can be based on what screen size or device that the user is viewing it upon. So if you focus too much, and I've had lawyers who focus too much on saying that, oh, when, I, when I'm on this screen, I see this, and when I'm on this screen, I see that, well, interact, your website should be responsive, and it should rearrange according to the device that it's on. Next, we will talk about the role of aesthetics. The average user only spends just 30 seconds on a website before they move on. That's half a minute. So it's very important to have something that's visually pleasing to grab their attention. Aesthetics is known as the set of principles guiding the work of an artist, and that includes colors, contrast, graphics, and layout. A website's aesthetics can influence a brand's credibility and perception. In fact, studies have shown a clear link between solid design and a site's credibility. Aesthetics really does have its function. Pleasant visual designs make your potential clients feel more relaxed. As a result, they tend to find well-designed websites more credible and easier to use. It's easier on the eye, and so it's considered to be more user-friendly than something that is ugly. But you also have to have something that keeps their attention once you've grabbed it. How you keep it is by having good content that answers a potential client's question about their case or problem and that is presented in a readable format. And by what I mean by read readable format, that is readability. Readability is about featuring your content in chunks, so having headlines, bullet points, the occasional bold, and having something that they could easily scan for titles and information is what you want. Having the content there is very important. If your website is beautiful but empty, then it is going to be useless. Now, on the examples that I have on this, on this slide, to the left-hand side, I have what is considered a visually beautiful website, but that has poor user, um, that, but that has poor usability. And the reason that is, is because one, there's no sense of hierarchy. Two, there's very little bit of white space. And three, they've, they've basically confused the user. When you're looking at this, you can't tell what is more important. Where should your eye land first? How do you scroll? How do you click? Are there buttons? Where, is, where should you go first? This is kind of, it's beautiful visually, but functionality-wise, this is not a good site. And to the right-hand side, I have a good example of readability. So as you can see, the content is chunked out, and there is a difference in the hierarchy as far as the font size of the titles and the body content, which kind of helps your eyes ease down as you read and tells you what is more important. And of course, the call to action, which is the button, is in a pop color that stands out from the rest of the content on the page. Next, we will discuss a little bit, we'll, go, we'll dive further into usability. Usability is the measure of the quality of user experience when a person interacts with your site. On the web, usability is critical. It's been described as a necessary condition for survival. If your firm's website is difficult to use, then potential clients will leave. If the homepage isn't clear about what you do, people will leave. If it's hard to read or it doesn't answer your client's questions, they will leave. Leaving your website is the first line of defense for users dealing with a difficult site. Four main characteristics that make up a usable site are, one, quick and easy to learn, two, efficient to use, three, rapid recovery from errors, and four, easy to remember. Some lawyers just want all of the bells and the whistles. They want a video background, they want slides with tons of different types of movement, and they want other items that just make their sites heavy and slow. 
It makes it harder for your potential clients to read the content on the slides and to interact with your site overall because it is slow. And then all of that effort that you put into it becomes a waste of time. They're just going to leave your site anyways. You have to know when too much is too much and when to scale back a little. Readability and usability is much more valuable than having a very fancy website. Studies have shown that an, appli an application's usability could influence its aesthetics, meaning the frustration a user feels when a site with poor usability will negatively influence their perception of the site's visual design. So if it's hard for them to use, they're going to assume that the site is terrible. They also show that users perceive more aesthetically pleasing designs to be easier. So if it's pretty, it's slightly easier. So what this means is that usability and aesthetics are equally important to your site. But if you choose to focus only on one over the other, then that will lead to an incomplete and unsatisfactory solution. They are two sides to the same coin. Next, we will discuss about not sweating the small stuff and focusing on what matters. So if you're sitting there and you're saying to yourself, is this the right shade of blue? Is this the right font? Then you're probably focusing on the wrong thing. Focusing too much on minor details like these can get in the way of an attorney launching their site or focusing on content. Focus on what's important. Spending a week or two of your time that you could be pulling in new clients, going back and forth over different colors or a very similar font will not change the overall meaning or functionality of your site. And you're, you're losing business while you're wasting time on that. At the end of the day, each color has a meaning. Blue means what blue means. The fact that you use a slightly lighter or a slightly darker shade does not remove the meaning of the color. The important thing is to get your site out there, to promote your firm, and to get business. Everything else is secondary. Some people might argue that imagery is part of aesthetics, and that is, in, in a way, correct. But if you're using stock imagery and you're worried about the difference between a downtown image of your town or a practice area specific image or a professional photo of your, loca of your office itself, they'll each have the exact same impact as long as they are high quality images. The difference between the subject matter will not change the impact on your clients. But what will have an impact is the time that you wasted on these minor details. Next, we will discuss the importance of white space. White space is one of the most overlooked and underutilized parts of a good website layout. Attorneys sometimes perceive it as empty space and a waste of screen real estate, but it's one of the most valuable parts of your design. White space is a space between your columns, your text, and your images. It gives your potential clients' eyes some room to breathe. It makes people want to keep reading. When it is used well, it can really be transformative of your web design. White space increases reliability for your client. It actually helps people understand what they're reading, which adds up to a better user experience overall. According to a research done by, done by Human Factors International, found that white space increases read, reader comprehension by almost 20%. And here are some other ways that white space can benefit your website. For one, it can increase interactions. Visitors are always in a hurry, so good white space prevents distractions that slow down your visitors. It will get them to your call to action faster than bombarding them with a lot of different things to look at at once. And once kind of piggybacking off of that, having more white space better highlights your call to actions. So a lot of attorneys think that making something bigger or bolder or adding images to a button will draw people to it. But research has found that surrounding it with more white space can actually be more effective. And in the end, it makes your site tidy and it makes it more impressive. So basically, white space is essential because it indicates fineness and ingenuity. It is not bare or minimal when it's used correctly. It adds elegance to your site. So here's an analogy about tidiness that I like to use, and I think it helps people understand a little bit about the role that white space plays on their website.
So if you've ever tried to have a conversation in a noisy restaurant or you've walked down a, a club fair or any kind of fair overall, you might get a sense of what I'm trying to explain. All that noise in the restaurant makes it much more difficult to focus on what you and your table mates are saying. In the case of the crowded club fair, the visual noise that bombards people is shuts down their brain. Which booth should they go to? There's so many. Where should their eyes land? There's no clear sense of what's important. So then nothing becomes important and people will skip it all. And the same thing goes with your website. Too much content or pictures or colors can be and will become visual noise. And that's why watch space is important. If there's too much visual noise, it makes it hard for people to make a decision and they will skip making a decision overall. What is, if too little white space will increase confusion and decrease readability, too much white space can mean a lack of content to your users and a lack of guidance. So it's important to have a really good balance of white space on your website. Next we will discuss Hicks Law, which is the concept of less is more. Hicks Law basically says that the more choices we have, the longer that it takes us to make a decision. The fewer choices that we have, the quicker our decision will be. And Hicks Law can be applied to fine tune the user experience. We can apply it to your links, buttons, content, pages, navigation, images, and so much more. Building a great user experience can be achieved by slimming down the website, reducing user confusion, and increasing the conversion rates of call to action elements. One way to achieve that is through progressive disclosure. So by holding back some of the options until they are completely necessary, you help the users maintain focus on the primary set of choices while reducing clutter and confusion. Also, think about white space again. If you make use of white space in your design, you can direct where your users look. And this way, you can reduce the options competing for their attention. You can have too much of a good thing and you can easily confuse your users with too many choices. When working on the visual design of your site, you should take Hicks Law into consideration and minimize links and options, thus streamlining the user's decision-making process. Next, I will explain to you how your website links can be important. Having poor link text in link text titles is a major accessibility requirement for websites. Most sites use overly general link text like click here, which says nothing about what is to be found when they do. Link text should be clear and it should make sense out of context. I found that instead of using non-informative phrases such as click here, read more, link to, info, or verbs in general, it's sometimes better to make proper and concrete nouns in the sentence a link. Nouns can help the users quickly grasp what they're clicking without having to read the entire sentence or phrase, whereas verbs are vague and don't usually give a clear picture of what to expect. So for example, as you can see on this slide, instead of writing view our firm's case results here, where here is the highlighted element, choosing something like view our case results, where the noun case results is the anchor text, is a better form of linking. Poor link text hurts usability. So let's say you have a user who is visually impaired in some way. Maybe they're using a screen reader. If so, they would have a hard time understanding vague links without having to have the whole page read to them word for word. In the end, the wording of the link does make a difference to the user. So it's important that we make our links visually distinct from the body text and specific to the page or document that they link to. Next, we will touch upon your firm's brand. Your brand is your promise to your customers. One thing I often see is that attorneys want lots of content in their logo. However, attorneys don't realize that your, your, your logo shouldn't be a sentence or a paragraph or even a phrase, but a simple visual representation. It should be easy to recognize and remember. The goal here is to reduce the amount of content that you have in your logo. More text does not scale it is very hard to read. And you should think about it this way. If your current logo has a lot of text in it, you should ask yourself, could you read this if this was printed on a pen? 
could you read this quickly while you're passing a sign on the highway? A good logo has to stand out on its own without a tagline. A tagline is something that you can highlight in other parts of your site, but it doesn't necessarily need to be attached to your logo. Your logo has got to represent your company even when it scales. You have to look to the future and create something that's sustainable, something that will work if you were to add more partners and were to grow your firm. Your brand helps to set you apart from your co competition. Another thing I often see is that attorneys who love another attorney's website or branding and they want theirs to look just like it. Don't try to be another, another lawyer and this is why. If your website looks just like another firm on the web or your branding looks identical, those potential clients are going to have to use other factors to decide which one of you they will choose. So has that firm been around longer than you? Are they better established than you? Do they have better reviews than you? If you haven't built a strong web presence yet, mimicking something that you like too closely can be a real detriment to your business. Here's something else to think about, your domain name. So a strong brand generates referrals. Think about the brand separate from yourself. People love brands, people eat brands, people wear brands, people are constantly telling other people about brands that they love. That said, you can't tell someone about a brand that you can't remember. So if your last name is hard to spell or pronounce, then it's probably not the best brand name or URL name. Have something that is easily recognizable, and in this case, the shorter, the better. So when defining your brand, I find that these core questions are a good starting point to ask yourself to help develop and fine tune your brand. So the first question that you should ask is what is your firm's mission? What is your vision? What is your purpose? What is the benefit for a potential client if they were to choose you over others? So basically what sets you apart from your competition? What do clients think about your firm? And if you're just starting out, what should clients think about your firm? What qualities do, do potential clients associate with your firm? And those qualities are things that you could kind of fine tune and set the tone for with a tagline or set key words on your site. Next, we will discuss your logo. In short, a good logo is simple, memorable, timeless, versatile, and appropriate. It's something your potential clients will easily recognize, and it features something unique without being overdone. So think about the logos that you know off the top of your head. For example, Coca-Cola has been timeless. It's featured roughly the same red and white logo since 1885. Your website will evolve with technology, and that's one of the things that we help you stay on top of here at Lawlytics. But your branding should be here to stay. Longevity is key. A good logo doesn't just go on your website. It may be featured on a business card, your letterheads, promotional items, pins, sponsoring banners on your booth at conventions, and of course your social media accounts. So it has to be versatile. You have to be able to write and visually represent it in a lot of different ways. So here are some good questions to consider to see if your logo is effective. Does it work when it's stacked? Does it work when it's shaded? Can you shrink it to the size of a postcard? Can you enlarge it to the size of a billboard? Can it be printed in reverse, so on light or and on dark backgrounds? If it only works in one color, then it's not going to be great. If you can't shrink it or enlarge it easily, then it's not going to work. It should be, it should be scalable to any size, both horizontal and vertical formats. Now here's another thing for attorneys to consider. Attorneys often gravitate towards typical legal images, so the courthouse, the pillars, the gavel, the steps, the balance, the scales of justice. But think about all the logos that you already know about that have nothing to do with the product that they represent. So Apple's a good example. Computer logos don't have to show computers. And Apple doesn't. It's an Apple, but it is a strong brand and it's iconic. You would know it anywhere. Car logos don't have to show cars. Subaru is a constellation, and Dodge, the Dodge logo is a ram. So don't feel that you are tied down to law-based and legal-based imagery only. Next, we'll discuss your tagline. 
does your law firm's tagline capture your brand? You might be able to recognize some of the taglines from the images on the slide. For example, Lay's, bet you can't have just one. M&M's, in melting your mouth and down in your hands. And of course, Dunkin' Donuts, America runs on Dunkin'. So all of these taglines are short, they are easy to remember, and they set a tone for the specific brand. Like for Lay's, bet you can't have just one, that tells me that one is delicious, and the second that I have one, I'm going to become addicted to it, I'm going to want to have so much more. So that kind of sets this tone for me that it is yummy. So you have to think about that as you're developing your tagline. Develop something that says something about your firm and is not just a long set of texts or a list of the different practice areas that you do. And one example that, that I like to use that has stuck with me for a long time is this. I used to live in South Florida and there was a personal injury law firm down there whose tagline was after 911 call 411 pain. And they used to create like slogans that would play on the radio and it would repeat after 911 call 411, after 911 call 411. And until this day, Every time someone says 911, I immediately repeat to myself, call 411 pain. So the tagline was catchy, it was short, it was easy to remember, and so for years to come, it has stuck with me and I've always remembered it. So this is the goal with a tagline. So now that we've talked about some of the basic design considerations, in February, we'll dig deeper into the elements of design that can have a psychological effect on your potential clients and encourage them to engage with you. We'll discuss choosing the right kinds of typeface, what colors mean, and what they can say about your firm, the various shapes of logos, and how that can affect a potential client's perception of your firm, as well as examples of how to make your content more readable, and so much more. With that said, I'm going to turn the mic back over to Dan. Thank you, Sophia. Well, everybody, we are about 70 slides into this webinar now and uh, nearing the two hour and 15 minute mark. I just have a few concluding remarks before we go to the questions and answer session. So if you have questions that you want addressed, I don't see any yet, uh, please go ahead and put them into the GoToWebinar questions area. Uh, and then in just a moment, we'll end the recording and get to the questions. But I, I want to say before before we get there, if you're just getting started or if you're trying to figure out how to reboot your immigration law marketing and make it work again, the good news is that you don't need to remember all the details that we went over in this webinar or implement them all at once. The important thing is to get started and to get started on the fundamentals. And if you're wondering where to start, we can help. And if you're already well on your way, Next month's immigration webinar in our GROW series will provide you with some actionable items that are easy to implement and over time uh, can and will significantly and sustainably move the needle in terms of revenue with your practice. I want to uh, mention that a couple weeks ago we did a webinar on online reputation management, uh, which is especially important for immigration lawyers. And uh, that that webinar is now available on demand if you go to lawlytics.com forward slash webinars. We, we also have uh, a bunch of other webinars that may be of use to people that are listening to this webinar and wondering about the other aspects of getting started or getting ready to grow. The other thing that I do want to point out is that uh, the week after next, on the 8th of February, we're going to be doing a webinar that really dives into uh, pay-per-click marketing for attorneys and goes over a lot of the logical fallacies that are built into the pay-per-click ecosystem uh, and, and really explains what's real and, and what's an illusion because that's where we see a lot of attorneys wasting both their time uh, and their money. 
And so if, if you have the opportunity, I highly encourage you to join us for that. It's free and it's it's available to Lawlytics members and to non-members alike. Uh, and if you have other practice areas in addition to immigration law that you're interested in growing, uh, we have done uh, webinars in several other practice areas in the START series that are available now on demand at the webinars page on the uh, Lawlytics uh, website. And uh, on uh, next week, we will be concluding it with the, uh, the final one in this series uh, that focuses on business law. I want to thank Sophia, Rachel, and Victoria for your presentations. And I want to thank all of you who attended this webinar today. I hope that it helped, and I hope to see you soon. And uh, if you have questions, if you're a Lawlytics member, you know how to find us, submit a support ticket, call us at any time. And if you're not yet a Lawlytics member and you're thinking about uh, getting started or exploring whether we're a match, the best way to do so is to visit the Lawlytics website and to simply press the schedule call button, uh, which will bring you to an online calendar where you can get set up uh, at your convenience with us. With that, I, I want to uh, thank everybody again, and let's go ahead and end the recording and take a look and see if we have any questions.